Why, good morning. And happy Monday. Is everybody muted? Good morning to you. Hey, how you doing, Richard? Still here. Well, you know, that's a good thing. Yes. <laughs> Better be seen than viewed. You're going to what? Better to be seen than viewed. <laughs> yes. Yes. That is true. Okay. Yes. And let's just keep it that way for a while, okay? You know? As long as we can. Yeah. Yeah. Keep hanging in there. So how are, how are the new digs? Richard? Pardon? How, how, how is the place that you're staying? Do you like it? It's fancy. It's fancy, huh? Oh. Far too fancy for me. Really? Really. Okay. All right. But they gave me three meals a day. We got a bed, I got a bedroom and Linda's got a bedroom and then we got a living room. Mm -hmm. About okay. 1,300 square feet. Okay. All brand new. Okay. They still, so, they're working so, to finish the price. Yeah, so you're sharing like a, a space, right? With two bedrooms and a, okay, a common area. Okay. That's really nice. Yes, it is. Yeah, do you have like a little kitchen area as well? Not really. Not really. Okay. No place to make coffee or anything like that? Oh, yeah, I got a full kitchen. Oh, okay. Well. But we're not cooking because they cook it for us. Right. Yeah. Well, that wouldn't work for me because I get up at four o'clock in the morning and I want a cup of coffee. So, you know. But, yeah, that, that little, you know, access to water and a place to plug the coffee pot in, really important to me. <laughs> okay. oh, <wow. laughs> so yeah 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 you don't want to see me without coffee it's not pretty <laughs> you know really really not okay anyway it's happy monday everybody same to you okay uh i sent out an email this morning and i sent out the images from friday i, yeah. I just i just saw them okay all right yeah i just wanted to make sure that everybody you know and I got, got those. I was remiss. Well, I wasn't really remiss. I just ran out of time on Friday. Friday was a busy day. <laughs> it was crazy. And then the weekend was crazy too. Pretty busy there. So, all right. Anybody get any painting done? I, I've just done some this morning. Uh, I didn't get anything done on the weekend. Okay. So. How about you, Karen? You're, Karen, you're muted. Mute. There we go. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Oh, okay, yes. I've, I've been taking a Saturday class at Spruill. Okay. And uh, it's basically painting flowers in a, a, a freer way you know without having to paint every petal are you in class mm -hmm. okay all right it's, it's good it's good i'm enjoying it i'm not usually a flower painter mm -hmm. but uh you know I'm, I'm enjoying it and get a couple of good ones good good and is it in oil or acrylic or water? acrylic okay. i have gone pretty much back to acrylic mm -hmm. Just easier, and I, you know, I acrylics and oils have have come closer and closer together, so that at times you can't tell the difference anymore. Right. Yes. Other other than when you're working with them, and the fact that the acrylics dry so much faster. Yeah, so, but that's for me. That's good. Yeah. Because I can then I can paint over it. Right. Well, you can layer. And yeah. build up layers more quickly, and yeah, uh, and you know, for me, I mean, that's one of the things that I like about acrylic. Um, and honestly, you know, I'm kind of split. You know, I I kind of like oil and acrylic. Well, mm -hmm. there's not anything I don't really like, um, including pastels. Other 
other than the fact that they're dusty. Um, I have I haven't painted in pastels in years, mm -hmm. but I still have them, and I'm tempted to try it again. Mm. That's I, I started off with pastels, mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, because I could draw well, I I felt like I could draw with pastels, and mm -hmm. I finally learned how to use them, mm -hmm. and uh, and it was fun, and I really like them. But what I don't like though, or what I'm afraid of, is watercolor. Oh, well, have no fear. I mean, jump right in. Um, yeah. Watercolor, the key to watercolor is, is not the technique of painting. It's the paper that you're using. That's mm -hmm. far more important than anything else in watercolor. Because if you don't have good quality paper, then you can't do a lot of the things that watercolor will allow you to do, like lift out color and move it and re-wet mm. it and rework areas. Um, because nine times out of 10, if you're having problems with watercolor, it's not, it's not the paint, it's the paper. And how- Or it's, it's the artist. No, it's usually, <laughs> no, it usually is the paint, you know, the uh, paper. Um, I, I will say that. Pardon? I will second that motion. <laughs> the, the paper or the artist? The paper. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, because uh, again, you know, if you have good quality paper and, you know, let's say you don't get exactly what you want, you can still go back in and, you know, blot out a lot of that paint and lift it and then go back and rework that area. If you have like really poor quality paper and you try to do that, it starts, peeling and doing all kind of you know yeah. stuff that make it really really difficult and ugly <laughs> so you know so yeah Charles, i meant to uh, send you a couple of my portraits that i had done did i send it to you or not well that's the thing you sent me an email saying that you were going to do that or that you and and i think i sent you back an email that said well if you were you didn't send anything Okay, uh, maybe after this actually. class, I'll try and send it. And yeah, then tomorrow, two. what time is your? At two. At two. Two. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now notice, you know, I'm in a different place. Oh, you are. I am. Yes, I'm. I'm not at home, um, in Smyrna. I am actually sitting in Winder, Georgia, in my brother's office. I'm. I'm house sitting for him this week. And oh. him and his very old dog. He's on his way to Orlando. And so I'm, I'm sitting in a really nice, big, fancy office. And got mm -hmm. computer stuff all around me. And wow. And <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, that's if you're wondering what happened. And it's kind of dark in here, actually, you know, though I've got a desk lamp. So that helps a little bit. But mm -hmm. uh, anyway. So, uh, hi, Armando. Hello. How are this you? This morning, you, you were difficult this morning. I was difficult? I got it, yes. How, how was I difficult? I don't know if you, Fulton County or Sabrina, but I got it. Okay, all right. I had to do additional steps. All right, okay. Hi, Bernie. John, how are John, you? you? John, you are in total silhouette. Yes. yes. Yes, right. sometimes he does that. <laughs> oh, you're you doing want, that on purpose? <laughs> I, you want me to turn and get more light? <laughs> okay. well, she, wants, she just wants to see your smiling face, that's all. I guess I will, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm second here. Okay, and then we got Linda here, as well as uh, Bernice. Hey, Bernice. Good morning. Hi, hi everyone. Oh, Miss Bernice is back. Hi, Miss Bernice. <laughs> Great, great, great. Yeah, okay. And then, of course, Veronica's here, too. And hey, you any better? Yes. Ta-da! We can see you. Yes. It's not, not full light, but it's... it's yeah. You know, I love that picture behind you. Yeah. The way oh, the glass is painted in the... In the uh, I'll be right back. Now, the Karen, that's the, the watercolor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She left. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, so... That's my, that's my patio. Yeah, okay. So today, uh, we're going to take a look 
at uh, a couple of different things. Um, one of them, we're going to start off with, uh, and this is an uh, oil painting, I believe. And uh, it's, it's a little time lapse. It's only about seven minutes. But it's about an approach to painting a realistic winter scene. Now, interestingly enough, it's a winter scene without snow. Okay? So maybe this person is down in the southeast. Um, so we're going to start there. And then we're going to kind of cover all kinds of things. And for those of you who attended the class on Friday for the drawing class and are still confused about that perspective thing, I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you. Okay. You promised um, uh, to send us that stuff. I am. Yes. Okay. But, and I'm, that's what I'm talking about, Armando, is uh, I'm going to suffer through a almost four hour long video on perspective and I'm going to take some screenshots and then on Wednesday I'm going to kind of walk you through those okay so I'm going to watch the four hour video hopefully we can condense it down to maybe a half hour and uh, and I'll be sending out a lot of the screenshots with some explanations uh, via email and that way you can actually look at it you know and uh, maybe get the gist of what's going on there okay sound like a plan yes okay <laughs> <laughs> all right yes i know everybody was like ah, perspective. you know kind of crazy so all right so let's get started let's do the winter winter scene first and then we'll um oh man we're gonna be all over the place today all right Oh, skip an ad. Let's go full screen. There we go. Mm. Yeah, this truly must be something between YouTube and Zoom. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when I'm watching YouTube and I'm not running it on Zoom, I have like no problem. Yep. And then when I'm watching it on Zoom, it skips around. Again, I'm thinking this is oil paint. It might be acrylic, though. Colors. Yes. I don't know it's me, but I noticed that the paint in oil, the color they are better, more clear than the oil that in acrylic. Well, that's not totally true. It's uh, the difference is that when you mix a color in oil and you put it down, it'll stay the same. Yes. Yeah. With acrylic, you've got to kind of allow for a shift. Yeah. And it's normally going to go slightly darker. I uh, I have learned to work with acrylic 
yet. I'm pushing myself because it's easy to clean the brushes, but uh, I don't like it with the chain color of mine. Yeah. yeah, well, acrylic, I mean, that's the advantage is that it dries quickly and you can go back and rework areas and paint over and layer and build paint and you don't have to wait, you know, so, but, you know, but then you have to get used to that shifting color. Mm -hmm. As long as you can do that, you'll be good. Sorry, I missed that. Charles, is this uh, painting with acrylic? No, this is actually painting. I'm um, pretty sure this is oil paint. Okay. Who is it? I'm sorry, I had to leave for a minute. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll give you his name. Uh, okay. okay. But this <laughs> is only a, like a six minute like time lapse video um, of painting a winter scene. Obviously, not somewhere where it snows so, or pre snow. guy likes a lot of little brushes. Mm -hmm. you know, not a big fan of that. But like okay. But notice, you know, he does like a lot of stippling with the end of the brush to build up texture. And particularly in the foreground, see how he's bringing out the textures in the grass and all the different surfaces. Again, helping to pull that forward and let the mid ground and things go back. Since this does seem to be oil paint, this is not an a la prima painting. So this was probably shot over several days, if not a week or so, or more. Because a lot of those surfaces would have to be fairly dry while he's working back in over them. Notice that he's using like a mall stick or a bridge to keep his hand off the surface. Okay, well, okay, I didn't need to do that. So, okay, hang on. Um, okay, I don't want to do it. All right, let's be 
the winter scene. Michael James Smith huh. did that video, okay? I can't like, imagine doing all of that in that little tiny brush. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that would, well, I mean, when he started off, he was using some, I wouldn't really call them large, I would call them kind of mid-sized brushes. Yeah. And uh, you know, he basically scrubbed in and, and blocked in his shapes. And then after he did his shapes, then he went back and started layering paint over each of those. And, um, you know, probably the first minute or two of the video was probably on like the first day because he scrubbed everything in. And then particularly in the background and sky and clouds and uh, the distant hills, he went back in and he blended and softened edges and things. And then, um, and then he seemed to kind of jump up to like the foreground mm -hmm. um, and begin to, you know, build up a little more, you know, depth and detail in things. Um, and then, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm sure this was not a a la prima, like one day painting. Yeah. And, and he was working, he's working, you know, pretty thin and pretty flat. You know, he's not building up like a lot of depth in the paint. Um, and he was doing, like I said, you know, he was doing a lot of stippling, um, where it's like you'll take the brush and it will be dry and you'll just kind of dip, uh, you know, or pounce the brush into the paint and get, get the paint right on the end of the tip and then just very lightly, you know, kind of apply it. You know, but not in a stroke, but, you know, just more like a, you know, you're, you're just making like little dots, right? But with a bigger brush and a lot of bristles, it, it kind of gives you this textural effect. Um, and so he was doing, you know, several passages of that. And again, you know, that may have been like over not just one day, maybe over several days, you know, mm -hmm. to build up those, those textures and, and get the... Uh, you know, get the depth in the paint um, that he ended up getting without any blending. Okay. okay. So there was that one. Um, let's check out Mr. Sergeant here. Okay. So this is a. The old master said secretive image projecting devices that. Uh, we can just later. Why don't we have better ways to help? All right. Um, so like I said, Today Chelsea Lang. Today I want to talk about gonna, the greatest painter of all time. Her opinion. Okay. <laughs> all right, let's start you over, Chelsea. Today I want to talk about the greatest painter of all time, John Singer Sargent. I'm going to be breaking down observations other master painters have about his work and talk about how we can analyze, understand, and practice those elements of his style to bring the parts of them that speak most to us into our own work. To illustrate the stylistic elements we love about Sargent, I'm going to be creating a master study of one of Sargent's portraits for you for this video. So whether you love Sargent, want to paint more like him, or you enjoy watching this master study time lapse, I hope you give this video a thumbs up and hit the bell icon because these are exactly the sorts of things I share on my channel every week. All right, so before I begin, I want to share with you. All yeah, so before she begins, okay, um, what did she just do? Anybody? Tone the canvas. Right. Yeah, what she's doing is, you know, she's beginning to tone the canvas down and notice how thin the paint is, right? So, you know, it's got a lot of turp in it. It's, it's really thin. She's just laying down these layers and she's using a pretty good sized brush, okay? Now, the interesting thing about her, she's working in the studio, right? But consistently, uh, she tends to work in a paint box. Right, and this is one of these little a la prima paint boxes that you can pack up and take anywhere, really. 
but you know she she sets it up and she uses it on her tabletop and uh you know it's it's a fairly you know simple and not real large uh box so she's working kind of medium to small sizes i'd say most of these are probably no more than like 12 by 16 or smaller okay Well, what I have learned about Sargent from other artists, because that was a huge part of what helped me to successfully study this painting. And it actually moved my entire painting journey forward in a really unexpected way in a short amount of time. And I'm not special in this. So if I'm having these takeaways and getting these results, I know that they are really gonna be applicable to your painting practice too. So I hope you stick around. So it has been a long, two years of painting alone in my studio. And I didn't fully realize that until I got to spend time with other painters in person again, which is where the journey of this painting really starts. In the past few months, I've met so many amazing painters, first at the Portrait Society of America conference in April, um, and then just a couple weeks ago, I got to work directly with Carolyn Anderson, a painter that I've admired for quite a long time, together in a workshop with her. And what stood out to me was that not only was I inspired and enjoyed just being around like-minded people and really talented artists, I actually learned a lot more than I realized or honestly could have expected when I was alone in my studio. At Portrait Society, I spent a full hour while I was there talking to artist Paul Newton uh, and just geeking out with him about Sargent's work. Um, he is a phenomenal portrait painter in his own right and has been quite celebrated. And I was lucky enough to chat with him about the finalists for this year's international portrait competition that um, Portrait Society of America puts on every year. Um, and we talked from painting to painting and just we're chatting about and analyzing what made each of these finalists so special. We spent quite a bit of time in particular in front of a Jamie Corrath painting, discussing the brushwork, edges, color choices, and comparing them to some of our favorite Sargent paintings. Paul was especially interested in a blue pigment that he noticed in a particular Sargent piece that didn't seem to change chroma as you would have expected when you mix it with other pigments. And something about Jamie's painting had reminded him of that and he was just kind of like musing aloud with me, wondering what Sargent might have used to make that one single mark in this one painting. We also discussed a talk given by Michael Shane Neal at the start of the conference. In that talk, Shane broke down some of his favorite paintings, but he lingered on a single Sargent portrait quite a bit, breaking down his favorite edges in the piece, Sargent's color choices, and just the simplicity of the brushwork and the cohesion of the color palette. This is probably one of my favorite parts of Shane's talk. When I think of Sargent, I usually think of women in opulent dresses and I might've been tempted to dismiss this portrait of this man, but this talk made me hungry to understand so much of Sargent's mastery here that I just don't think I had the skill or prowess to even see and notice before. So for this video, I rushed back home after Portrait Society and set right to work on completing a master study of that very painting. And that's what you're watching here. And boy, was, was this master study process. I was utterly hungry to get this as right as I could possibly get it. And learn and master as much as I could reasonably expect. So I picked a panel that was as close an aspect ratio to the original as I could get while being just a hair smaller, um, just for the sake of ease and the amount of time that I would give myself to work on this. And just as one quick note, the aspect ratio wasn't identical, so I made sure that I cropped the reference I had of Sargent's painting to match the aspect ratio of my panel, so I understood exactly the proportions I should expect to see in my master study. 
On top of that, I knew that I was set up for a little bit more success with this piece than I was in my previous Sergeant Master study, which I will link above in case you have not watched me paint that already. But I knew this because there was simply less going on in this piece. The background is plain. I have more space in which to render the face. I didn't have to break out like the one hair brush to try and capture the face. Um, and the only other factor here is his uniform, which is quite simple compared to the billowy, ornate um, satin finish skirt that I was painting in my previous Sergeant Master study. So to begin this piece, the very first thing that I set out to do was to actually put together a plan. And the first piece of this plan was me asking whether any part of this painting needed to be transparent. And right away, I noticed that the background of Sargent's piece appeared to be slightly transparent. This is something I can tell from just having a lot of practice under my belt, um, working with transparent paints and understanding the kind of texture and shifts in color that happens when the paint isn't at full opacity. So I knew I needed to get that transparent portion of the painting in early and then leave it alone because typically once you put paint down, you can only get more opaque unless you're intentionally working in glazes, which isn't how Sargent painted. So my very first steps for this portrait, you'll notice, especially if you go back and just rewatch the very beginning of this video, is that I sketch in the subject and I get a transparent wash in the background. And it's not enough to just kind of like place them in and get it close enough. Like I spent time getting these right. So making sure the value shifts and the brush strokes in the background are exactly what I want them to look like in the finished piece. And I also had to make sure that I didn't have any drawing marks for the figure accidentally inserting themselves into the background in a way that I don't see in Sargent's rendition. As a part of this, the next thing that had to happen was that I had to make sure that my drawing was spot on. And that's for the exact reason that I just named. So especially the parts of the drawing that describe the contour of our subject here. Because once I finished that background, I need it to be done. And I could tell by the way the background strokes never came over top of the figure that it would have been painted first. And it really wouldn't be touched up at all after, except just to the left of the subject's ear in Sargent's painting. I'm not sure why exactly. Um, I'm guessing it's either because that edge needed to be darkened next to the ear, or honestly, what I think might be more likely is the Sargent made a very slight drawing error the background had already set up, he wasn't going to rework it, and so he made a mark to actually opaquely cover up that drawing mistake. So in the past, I would have been a bit more flexible than this about the drawing and the process and the ordering of everything that went down on this painting, but I'm at the point where I've been painting long enough that I could see that this background really needed to be complete and accurate before I moved on. And I wouldn't give myself permission to move past it until I was 100% satisfied that this part of the painting was complete. This is also true for the drawing. So from here, I begin to insert the drawing of the interior features of the face. So the eyes, the nose, the facial hair, um, the hairline, etc. And you'll notice, especially if you look at exactly the point in this time lapse where I begin blocking this in, that I really didn't focus on describing each feature. I just made very simple, like single lines showing where the features go. And once again, I check them. I do not let close enough be good enough. <laughs> um, there are a lot of ways to check a drawing, including measuring, using mirrors, working site size. But I choose a method here that for me is very fast and comprehensive. And that is that I take a snapshot of the painting, I load it into Photoshop, and I transparently overlay it atop of the reference. There I can quickly see how my drawing lines line up with every aspect of the Sargent portrait. I can make necessary corrections, and then I can begin to go in and describe the features with more nuance, shifting from you know, simple lines indicating the features to more anatomically descriptive shapes. I stick with the same basic tone of paint, which is a combination of transparent oxide brown, ultramarine, and I think a little bit of iridium. 
Um, that's what I use for the background, and this is what I keep using to lay in the initial drawing, focusing on the dark areas. And once I'm satisfied, and once again, I know that the drawing is accurate, I begin to establish an overall flesh tone that corresponds with the lights. If you take a look at this exact stage, at first, this thinned out mixture <laughs> that's uh, terra rosa, yellow ochre, and titanium white will look a little ridiculous and washed out like the subject is wearing a mask. Um, but from here, I can begin to modulate that flesh tone, starting in the cheeks and the nose and the ears, to bring in a little bit of life. I believe I use permanent rose to do most of the heavy lifting and insert that warmth into the face. Um, and you'll see I use quite a bit of permanent rose after to put the lips in. Once these big shapes are in, I shift gears once again and I start thinking about what the final marks were for each portion of the face. I know I have the big masses down and the overall values and color are holding together well. And I did enough work on my drawing in the very beginning, double checking that to make sure that every should, everything should be in the correct place, that that just leaves putting down the right brushwork. The final brush marks the viewer will see. And that leaves me a lot of time to play with the edges and really start to understand Sargent's brushwork on a deeper level. So in this piece, I wanna talk about a few of the edges in particular. First of all, my very favorite part of this painting is the subject's hairline. There's this absolutely gorgeous transition from skin tone through this sort of golden ochre into the mousy brown of the hair. And I wanted to nail that transition. It's something, any other artist would probably paint in a much harder way, in a more literal way, uh, showing individual wisps of hair. But Sargent was a master of evoking what didn't have to be literally shown and understanding how human perception works in order to make that possible. So he understood that if you're looking at the subject's eyes, that you would take in that transition as a very soft edge of the hairline, not something where you could see those individual hairs. By contrast, the eyes themselves would feature some harder marks, particularly around the iris and the upper lash line. But because of the way the form turns and because of the color of the hair, things like the brows and the lower lash line once again stay quite soft. And this was my really big focus for this piece, understanding where the edges are hard, where they're soft, or where the mark is unblended, but still appears as a soft edge because the values are so well controlled. And this is what you see me doing for the whole rest of the painting, going through mark my mark, just thinking about exactly how to mix the right values and colors and use the brush in just the right way to make the marks that complete an area. So normally when I paint, I will kind of bring everything to a finish together, sort of working around the whole painting in stages. But with this, I wanted to be so mindful about every mark that I put down, since Sargent has literally shown me what marks to make, that I wanted to be much more intentional about stopping. And the easiest way for me to hold to that boundary for myself was to intentionally work in sections. For instance, I will take a look at the hair. I will identify what needs to be done to have my hair match Sargent's. I will go ahead and make those marks. I will double check that they look good, that they don't need adjustment. And then that's it, they're done. I won't go and noodle in the hair because something doesn't feel right. If I take a look at what I've done and I compare it to Sargent and I see that they're the same, I trust that what has to happen next happens on some other part of the painting. And the thing is, this worked. I was really blown away with just how successful this master study was, and not only for its own sake. There are so many little things that I routinely see myself thinking about in paintings now, specifically that I can draw back to this master study for credit. As you've seen in this video, master studies are a huge part of what can help us leap forward in our painting practice whether we want to learn from the old masters or someone contemporary who embodies some of the exact techniques we want to bring into our own work. So if you want to learn more about how I make that happen, I have a free masterclass breaking. Okay. So any thoughts about that? Wow. 
And uh, it, there were times when she painted with both hands. Until next time, mm -hmm. thank you for watching and happy painting. Yeah, you can you can do that. <laughs> Easy yes. for you to say. Yeah, I often paint with both hands. You know, depending on what side of the canvas I'm working on. Yeah, I'll paint. Are you my, are you right-handed? I was originally left-handed and converted to right-handed, so I'm actually ambidextrous. <laughs> some degree. That was not me. So can you be behanded, either one? Say what? Can you be either one? Uh, uh, left drawing and painting, yes. Writing anymore, no. I used to be able to write left and right-handed, but yeah, I can't do that anymore because I've I've practiced my my right-handed writing more than anything else but uh i'm left-handed and uh a few years ago in croatia i fell down and broke my shoulder mm -hmm. my left shoulder so i was incapacitated for you know several months mm -hmm. and uh i did learn to you know to paint with my right hand it, it wasn't it wasn't great, but it was good. And I do think that left-handed people, as a rule, are more ambidextrous because they have to be. Yeah. Well, you know, the and you kind of hit on a, a thing there where a lot of artists, you know, we, we're creatures of habit. <clears throat> and, you know, if you're used to picking up a brush with your right hand or your left hand or whatever, you know, you just do the same thing. You don't really think about it a lot. But actually, they've... They've done case studies now on people who use both hands and they've, they've taken like right-handed people and left-handed people and they've actually like forced them for about a year long period to work with their other hand. And they, they, they become what they call bi-hemispherical, right? In their brain, it actually rewires your brain you know, and the fact is that they found that that's a great way of actually expanding your mental capacity and your thinking um, by, you know, practicing, you know, working, you know, both left and right handed and becoming what they call bi hemispherical. Um, it, it literally does something different to your brain, you know, about you're, you're able to access, you know, both sides more readily. And, um, you know, there's, there's some great advantages to that, you know, so. I could you know, use that. Yeah. Well, the other thing is too, it keeps your brain younger. Have you ever heard of this term called uh, brain plasticity? Mm -mm. Okay. No. They've been doing a huge amount of study in, in that area and particularly with geriatrics, um, where they've got people who start off showing like early signs of either dementia or Alzheimer's, and they'll go through like a lot of these art studies with them, and they'll force them to use their opposite hand thing. And what that does is that forces the brain to adapt. And as as you force the brain to adapt, it also can reverse a lot of those signs of aging in the brain. Wow. Because it's literally, you're growing and reconnecting like new synapses in your brain. And uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing field of study um, that they've been working on, really for about the last 20 years. A and, hundred, uh, 100 years ago, mm -hmm. my mother-in-law, uh, went to school in, a, in a, what's called Friends School, which is a, the um, uh, Latter Day Saints or something like that. No, no, no. It's it's uh, Pennsylvania Dutch uh, huh? area. The Friends, uh, okay. but anyway, they did not believe in left-handedness. You were not allowed to be left-handed because that the left hand was the devil's hand. That's right. Mm -hmm. so, so therefore, uh, she was forced. She was a natural lefty. So she was forced into going right. Yeah. And then in middle school or high school, she broke her left wrist. Yeah. Uh, right wrist, rather. Mm -hmm. So she had to go back to her left hand. 
So, okay. so she was she was very very good at both uh, left hand right handed painting. Uh, for I mean, she let, you know kept that up for years and years and years. But uh, I thought it was interesting that say a hundred years ago it was so left handed. Oh my gosh, you were an awful person. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was my grandfather's view. I mean, you know, when I I mean he started when I was like very young, and I was very resistant to switching over, you know, to my right hand. And, um, you know, so yeah, he, he could be, he could be a little rough <laughs> about that. Um, so anytime I started picking stuff up with my left hand, you know, he like whacked me pretty good. Um, and that happened really up until I was probably about six years old or so. And by then I was pretty much so learned you pick everything up with the right hand, <laughs> you know. But then right around the time that I was a teenager, I, I had studied with Tony Manny and moved to California at that time. And again, you know, I, I injured my left shoulder and really couldn't use, you know, that arm. And so I had to go back and use my left. And... It, it was a struggle at first, but after a while, it just kind of fell right back into place. And, you know, I was able to draw and paint and do everything, you know, left-handed. Um, and, in fact, you know, started writing left-handed again. And uh, somewhere in early adulthood, you know, I got kind of distracted and stopped doing that and went back to my right hand. So I'm predominantly right-handed right now. But, you know... Again, every once in a while, you know, I go back and I'll draw left-handed or I'll paint left-handed. Um, and again, it's, it really does, you know, play with your brain. And, uh, and it's really actually a very beneficial exercise. So um, just like drawing upside down. It's, if you've ever like taken your reference and stuff and turned it upside down and drawn the whole thing upside down, you'd be amazed. Uh, it really does, it does something to your perception and to your hand-eye coordination uh, that's really, you know, it's, it's a good exercise. And uh, I guarantee you by the time that you finish the drawing, your brain will be tired, right? But that's a good thing, you know, because again, you're, you know, you're challenging it, you know, you're using it. And like any other organ in the body, you either use it, or you lose it, right? So, so I'd encourage any of you to, you know, play with that, okay? Um, all right, so let's, anybody get anything to say about Sergeant, you know, and, and about what she- I have a question. What is the, the title that is it, the technique of G-O-A-T? What does it stand for? Greatest uh, on, of, greatest of all times. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, great. Thank story. you. Thank you. Yeah. Now again, <laughs> that's that's her opinion. <laughs> you know, and Sergeant was very good. You know, I'm I'm not arguing that. You know, I mean, Sergeant was no slouch. Um, but yeah, I mean, there were so many painters, even contemporary painters um, of his time, that, in my opinion, were so much better. You know. Um, Cecilia Bow being one of them, <laughs> and if if you haven't looked at Ce Cecilia Bow's work, you really, you know, it's a treat, you know. Well, what's um, that name again? Cecilia what? Bow, B A U X. <clears throat> she was a, an American female painter. Uh, she was actually a contemporary and a classmate of Sargent's in France, as well as Mary Cassatt's. And uh, both, <laughs> both Sergeant and Bo, uh, Cassatt hated her with a passion. Because all through school, she won every competition. Not Sergeant, not Cassatt. <laughs> and they both, you know, they both had big egos. Of course, Bo did too. Um, but Bo was a very, she was a very interesting person. You know, because she was very independent. Uh, she had a very, you know, you could say very contemporary, very modern 
um, view of life. Um, you know, she was not going to settle for being married off to some man and then having him run her life. No, you know, she was definitely her own person and she lived that way her whole life. And she lived, uh, yeah. I think it was, she finally passed away, I think it was either in the late 40s or the early 50s. Um, but during her lifetime. Uh, how, how do you spell that last name again? B-A-U-X. Charles, I was not necessarily giving you my opinion of Sargent, although I do think he's great, mm -hmm. but it, the word goat was up there. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you're, it, you'll see it more and more today. For mm -hmm. some reason, everybody seems to be using that. Right. So that's what goat means, greatest yeah. of all times. All time. Right. Yeah. And that was, that was her opinion, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Chelsea Langs. Uh, and again, you know, we can debate that. <laughs> but, and everybody's got a different opinion. Everybody likes different artists for different reasons, you know. Um, and for me, it's like, you know, I found a kind of a collection of about a hundred artists, some of them very well known, a lot of them kind of obscure, but, you know, um, it's the things that they're doing that I think are really, amazing and it's it's kind of like this guy uh Hopsev, uh pushman right who I, th I think i played a video on a couple of weeks ago again an amazing painter you know just absolutely phenomenal at what he was doing um and just the way that he used paint and color was great so, so there's a lot of really good painters out there who don't get really the notoriety of people like Sargent, you know, and, uh, you know, some, you know, like Bouguereau and, you know, some of the others. So there's a lot of good painters out there. <clears throat> and it's my job to introduce you to a lot of them. So that's what we're going to do. Yeah. Can I quickly say that I, I did live in Asheville and moved back here uh, two years ago, but mm -hmm. in Asheville at the Biltmore House, they have two um, uh, uh, sergeants. Oh, yeah. I think they have more, don't they? I think they've got like four. Now they've got they've got the one of uh, oh uh, the guy who did like the garden plans for like Piedmont Park and oh know, and, and for Biltmore. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, they've got him. They've got you know. Uh, but they've got a couple of family portraits too that are small. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, but they've, they've got like three of them, you know, of sergeants. And some of them are kind of tucked away in obscure places, but I think they've got four total up there. Yeah. And it, has everybody, anybody been to Biltmore? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's, you know, it's getting a little bit pricey to go there now. <laughs> And, but, uh, you know, it's, it's well worth uh, the money, you know, to go. And mm -hmm. when you go, you really, really want to slow down. You really want to take the whole day, okay? And just really kind of go over the place because there's so much good stuff there. You know, the grounds, the architecture, the gardens, mm -hmm. and just, you know, a lot and of- And the, the kitchen, carpet. kitchen, the downstairs. Well, yeah, the kitchen and the swimming pool. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. I went there. Uh, I went there. We spent two days there. I went there with my ex partner who was into uh, art restoration. And we got a behind the scenes tour of going all the way down into the basement where they do all the restoration and stuff and meeting the restoration staff there. It's amazing. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it really is uh, just an incredible place. So, you know, if you get a chance to go, go, you know. Can I ask the question? Absolutely, Alva. How are sure. you? Um, I'm great. How about yourself? Good. And everyone else in the class. Yeah. Um, I'm one, I'd like to know, I was a little bit late. Who was the author of this video? And my second question is, she mentioned that she was checking the uh, drawing. 
Mm -hmm. And I didn't catch on, or maybe I didn't hear it, I don't know. What was she checking it with? Well, she was using kind of an, an interesting process where she would get to a certain stage, mm -hmm. she would photograph her, you know, her painting. Mm -hmm. And then on the computer, she would superimpose her painting over the over the original photo, mm -hmm. okay. you know, to check the proportions and things like that and make sure that the placement was right. Um, how, how did she do that? In Photoshop. Uh, well, Photoshop. Oh. Photoshop. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what you can do in Photoshop is you put, you can put layers, right? One image over the other and make one kind of, you know, semi-transparent so you can look at how they line up. Hmm. Yeah. And what was her name again? Uh, Chelsea Lang, L-E-N-G. Is she with the Portrait Society? No, I mean, she, she went to this last year's Portrait Society here in Atlanta. Okay. So she was there. She was talking about that during the, the video. Um, but, but no, she's, well, you know, to go, I think you have to become a member. I don't know <laughs> anymore. Um, but uh, no, she wasn't, she wasn't demonstrating anything, okay. anything there. She, she was just an attendant. She went. And by the way, how many how many people have heard of the Portrait Society of America? I have. It's expensive. Uh, I have. Yes. It is pricey. It is pricey. <laughs> let let me absolutely tell you something. If you're if you're serious about painting portraits and things like that, it's well worth your time to it go. Is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, literally for about five days, it's pretty much so from early in the morning till pretty late in the evening. Um, there's like nonstop workshops. Um, you can watch lots of demonstrations. A really fun thing is that they have these paint offs where they'll have like three artists and they'll have them up on the stage and they'll have a one model right. and they'll each, you know, within literally, I think it's about a two hour time limit, you know, start to finish, you know, do an a la prima painting or study, you know, of that live model. Right and it's incredible some of the stuff that they can, you know, do in that short amount of time. But it, Charles, it, yeah, I went. I went to it one time, and the first night mm -hmm. is so amazing mm -hmm. because that's when they have all of the all of the artists. These are all great artists, and they have them painting in a circle all at the same time they're painting different things but you can walk around and see what everybody's doing and uh or you could sit they, they have chairs there where you can just sit and watch one of them or you know watch you know a couple different ones whatever you want but it was so exciting to see that yeah yeah i've been to a couple of them i've been to two of them here in atlanta and one in washington and uh, mm -hmm. it's like just just to be able to get the opportunity to meet like some of these people who are on staff there um, and just have a conversation with them, you know, talk to them, you know, and they're just like, you know, you'll meet them, you know, like walking around and, you know, just strike up a conversation with them. And they're more than happy to spend time and really kind of talk about what they do, and, you know, how they approach things. And you can learn um, so much, you know, by just those, you know, 20 minute conversations, you know, little, little things that you'll pick up that, you know, un unless you really spend time around them, you know, watching them paint, you know, you're not gonna get. So yeah, it's a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so, do, do they still do it in Atlanta? They used to go back and forth between Atlanta and Washington. Well, it was Atlanta, Washington, and Miami. And once they did out in Houston, um, they move it, you know, around. But yeah, last year, well, this last year, it was here in Atlanta. Oh. 
Yeah, it was in April of this year mm -hmm. that they had it here. And I think that's the one that she was talking about, is the, uh, you know, this, this last year's, you know, after that pandemic. We say they skipped, yeah, I think they skipped two years mm -hmm. because of the pandemic. They didn't have it. Oh. So, but it's like, you know. You um, see some of it on, on they had some class workshops online. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. now that was, that was 2021. Yeah, that uh, both the Portrait Society, yeah, they, they decided to, to do it online instead of doing it in person. And, um, and in fact, it's Plain Air Magazine. Uh, they did their whole plein air conference for two years online. And uh, I think this year was was uh, the first time that they actually decided to try to do it on site again. <coughs> but, yeah, any of those, any of those organizations, things like that, any of those conferences, um, you know, hey, anytime you can get out and rub elbows with, you know, a bunch of working artists. All right, anybody got any other questions before we move on? No? Okay. All right, so let's, uh, let's look at a couple of artists before we get into, uh, well, actually, no, let's do this. Uh, this, this is, uh, it's about sketching. Um, working in your sketchbook. Do this 15 second dental hack before going to bed to, to get a Hollywood smile, regardless of your age or current yeah, dental okay. condition. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, yeah, okay. Now notice that he's drawing with a pen. Mm -hmm. And see, he's just like, you know, touching the pen down, just like putting like little tiny light marks. What is the purpose in doing it with pen, other than you kind of can't change it? Well, if you're working over it with a water media, right, to add color, the pen is permanent and doesn't bleed. So you can put down, you know, a, a, a permanent line and it will stay in place. A lot of times with like graphite pencils and things like that, if you sketch it out with a pencil, it'll, it'll still have kind of a ghosted line, but it just kind of melts into the color and it doesn't really give you that nice edge, you know, about where things are. Now, I think what you'll find is that, you know, he'll do like these very light sketches and, you know, kind of get the proportion and where things are. And then after that, he'll come back in and maybe wash in some color with that light sketch and then go back in with the pen again and reinforce it. And or, you know, he might take the direction of doing like more definite lines and then work color. So you can go either way. But can you um, fix it if you screw it up? With the um, pen? Can you fix it? You mean, can you get rid of the lines? And the yeah. Paper? No. Yeah. You realize something's out of proportion or something? Yeah. No. But that's kind of the beauty of it is that it forces you to slow down and check your relationships, you know, oh, as yeah. you move along. And you don't screw up. <laughs> yeah, and, and you don't really screw it up. I mean, you know. Oh, if, I could. Well, I mean, if you're off a little bit, then you're just off a little bit. And it's, at the end of the day, 
you know, nobody's going to sit there and look at the reference photo or, or be at the place you were at, you know, and they're not going to hold your painting up to it and go, you know, that's just not right. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's, it's good to be accurate, right? Yeah. But that's, but that's not the only thing that you have to really concern yourself about. You know, it's also capturing the mood, the light, the movement. Um, you know, there's so many different aspects to, to doing a piece of art. And, you know, it's it's all not about, you know, did you draw that, you know, mechanically perfectly? And it's like, it doesn't matter sometimes. Seem like obviously he's making that window a little fat, but anyway. yeah. In the end, but you do it and you live with it. Yeah, you put it down and move on. <laughs> yeah, it still gets the intent, you know. And you know, is it recognizable? Is that piece of architecture? Yeah. So evidently, he's going to go back and flush out his whole drawing first before he adds color. Yeah, and notice that he's not terribly worried about making you know perfect straight lines. You know, they're a little wiggly and you know they're interpretive. Is the pen that he's using like a, 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 a what do you call it? A, it's a fountain pen. A fountain pen, just a regular fountain pen. Well, it is, but I'm sure that he has like a cartridge of like India ink or a private ink in there oh. that won't bleed. Marriage is the easiest thing on the planet. Really? <laughs> Says who? <laughs> Said no one ever.
Now, I will point out one thing that he's doing that, and there's nothing wrong with what he's doing, but it's just like, if I were doing something like that, I would probably have another piece of paper called a slip sheet to put between my hand and the paper so that, you know, even those little sketchy lines that are down below, I wouldn't smudge and smear around, so. Plus the oil, so your skin would be on the right, paper. Right, your skin and stuff, yeah. Yeah, because when you go back in and start adding color to the paper, if you have oily skin, um, sometimes, you know, that will get into the paper and then you'll get, you know, with watercolor, you'll get like a, a resist because of the oil, you know, that's seeped into the paper. So, so slip, slip sheets are good. Anybody want a custom made front door from Birmingham? I don't know. Yeah, Not today. Not today. Give me about eight months. I might need one over there in Alabama. You may, yes. <laughs> I am here at the Lettuce Grow Seeding Farm where the magic begins. We grow the baby plants.
Girls, this is all real time, huh? At least so, yeah. Wow. Yeah, we've got a, a video on perspective that uh, <laughs> I was talking about earlier. And uh, there's, it, it's a live recording and it's, I think it's a, a woman and she's just doing all these perspective exercises and then writing out the rules by hand. There's no dialogue to it. It's all just, you know, there's you know, <laughs> titles in it. And, um, you know, it's probably about a four or five hour long video. Uh, and rather than have you guys watch it, you know, I'm, I'm going to basically go through it, screenshot it, and then we'll go through it. Hopefully a little bit quicker than four and a half hours. So. That's, that's one of my goals this week while I'm here at my brother's is to just get through that video and you know, screenshot it down so we can actually get some benefit out of it. A long time to stay focused. Yeah. Now, I, was, I would probably watch the first probably hour and a half of it so far. And, uh, and it's a real slow process because about the time that you want a screenshot, you know, and you click on it, you know, that her hand is moved back over. Right. And, and so you got to try to back it up just a little bit to get the shot that you want. Sometimes it takes, you know, three or four tries, you know, to get it to the right spot. Do you want to take yes. a screenshot of it? Just creating paintings. But in case you want to know what I do in my spare time, that, uh, <laughs> I used to like to watch these things on, uh, you know, online. Mm -hmm. And my husband always teased me and he would say, are you watching paint dry again? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's exactly what it is, I guess. <laughs> what it is. Yeah, to some people, yeah, it would, it would kind of be akin to that. Yeah. So. Okay. Georgia homeowners, there is one way. Okay, come on. Skip. Move on. Today, I nope. want to talk about the greatest painter of all time, John what Singer Sargent. What happened there? Hang on. Somehow we skipped out of that video. Let's go back. The parts of them that speak most to. Okay. Let's see if we can get back where we were. <laughs> I think it was at the end. I think it ended. Yeah, it ended. Yeah, I think it was at the end. Yeah. Was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was it. I was watching the, the ticker. Uh -huh. he, was, he was working on the tree. Yeah. yeah okay. I Maybe it was. Okay. I thought there was more to it. I thought yeah. they were going to put color in there, but evidently not. All right. I, um, I have a comment. Yes. And if you look, I just changed my background. If you look at my background, I painted the same scene last year. Oh, okay. Cool. If yes, but. 
but you went around the corner. That's interesting. Yeah, that's right. It's not quite the same for uh, same, right. same, but it's the same. I think it's the same place. It is. It's same architecture and yeah. Yes. And and where is this? I don't know. It's a picture I got off the internet, so I really can't say it. It was a year ago, March, that I did this. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I thought that was uh, when I saw that when I saw the picture he was drawing from. I thought that looks familiar. <laughs> I, like your, I like yours better, John. Oh yeah. well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, in 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 a lot of ways, I do too, because obviously it's got color in it, but also. You know, John didn't uh, focus on the bell tower. You know, he seemed to be focused more on this corner up here. Correct. You right. know, to the right. And that was really more the focal point. Um, you know, that works really nicely. So. Can you make that bigger so that we can see it better? Uh, well, John would have to talk. Oh, okay. Well, is that, is that there you go. Talking? Is it? Can you see it now? I keep, I'll keep jabbering away to you. <laughs> is it bigger? I don't know. I can't tell. It is. Yeah. You can yeah. always count. Okay. Oh. All right. Everybody get enough of that? Yes, no, maybe? Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm going to go visit it. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Yes. Now we see John again. Yay! Yeah, here I am. Here I am. Yes. Magic transported. That's right. There you go. See? It's the magic of Zoom. Here you are. You just zoomed in. All right. Uh, anybody else got any comments about that uh, last video? Come on. We know you got something to say. Well, did, did you actually, did you see, did you actually color it then? Or did, was it just well, that's, a, that's the thing. You know, I, I thought that this one had you know, him laying in some, like, washes and things. Um, I thought that was part of the, the whole deal. It's like, uh, dee -dee -dee -dee. well, it says less color, but it actually shows, you know, uh, a rendition with color on it. But it stopped short of there, so. Charles, can you explain the difference between watercolor and gouache? Oh, yeah, easily. Watercolor is a transparent medium. Gouache is a version of watercolor that's opaque. Gouache is sort of closer to uh, acrylics. Acrylics. <laughs> Not really. Isn't yeah. it? No. No? Mm -mm. Now it's more like watercolor, except that it's opaque. Okay. You know, um, actually, the the closest medium to it um, is tempera. Ah, right. Okay. Okay. You know, um, now there's. I know when everybody thinks of tempera, what they think of is the school that you're using, you know, or the paint that you used in grade school. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but there are there are actually different qualities of tempera and um, you know temper for the most part is a dry pigment you know it's a dry medium and people like Andrew Wyeth uh, used tempera and their binding medium was egg album. and that's what they call it egg tempera so he would you know break you know, some eggs, separate out the album, right? And then he would, you know, mix pigment into it each day when he was getting ready to start painting. And, um, and then, you know, do the section of the painting that he was going to work on that day. And uh, the thing with using egg, egg is a protein, and, uh, or the album is, and it's, it can act as a binder, but not only a binder, it can also seal the uh, pigment. Uh, so you don't varnish it at the end, and, but it actually has this protective film you know, on it at the end. Um, and so if is you look at Andrew Wyatt's work, I mean, most of that is egg temperate. 
Is egg tempera used on watercolor paper? Mm hmm yeah. And yeah. gouache is used on watercolor paper? It can be, yeah. Yeah, it can either be watercolor paper or some kind of, any kind of archival paper. Excuse me. Yeah. Now, gouache can be used on like that uh, reefs we have hit, right? You know, that you draw on, um, which is also like a print paper, but you can use it, you know, as a mixed media paper. Uh, you can also use gouache on canvas, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be paper. Okay. Um, but there's a lot of different uses for it. And in fact, you can use gouache on wood. Um, a lot of, like in the, uh, in, in Asia, you know, where they do a lot of decorative painting on like wood surfaces and things like that, they'll use gouache and then they'll seal it with gouache uh, to protect it. But that's usually the pigment. And the nice thing about gouache is it's okay, you can layer one color over another, you know, and, you know, it, it's so opaque that, you know, it just lays over the top of it. And as long as you don't get it real, real wet, you're not going to, you know, blend those layers together. So, I like wash. It's, it's a lot of fun to work with. It just gives you kind of flatter colors, you know, um, which are easier to photograph, by the way. So uh, let's see, where do we want to go from here? Any, well, anybody else got any questions about, you know, what we were, you know, drawing with a pen, you know, sketching, you know, with a pen, things like that? You should. He didn't, he didn't use much of what we looked at last time on the different texture techniques of uh, cross hatching and stuff. Uh, no. And he, Basically, did lying. Right. Yeah, it was all lying. And again, I think there's a second part to that video somewhere where he starts washing in color. And that's where he starts building up, you know, textures and layers and things like that. Are you saying washing or gouaching? Wash. W -A. Wash. Yeah. Okay. With watercolor. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're using, you've got a pen line that's a permanent ink line. That you're not gonna, you know, if you get it wet, it's not gonna bleed, right? Mm -hmm. And you can wash, wash, W A S H, color over it. You think? Would the gouache cover the line then? It's like watercolor. Wash would, yeah. Watercolor would not. Watercolor would not, yeah. And usually when you're using like pen line and adding color to it, you're gonna do it with watercolor, not with gouache. You want the you want the line. Yes. Yeah. That's the whole purpose of using the pen and doing your, your pen line first because it becomes part of you know the final image. Okay. And and then when you wash, are you washing inside the lines? You can. <laughs> you can get outside the lines too if you want. Okay. You know, it depends. It depends on the fact that you want. Usually for architectural pieces, yeah, you do, you know, kind of precise and keep it. Yeah. You know, if it's if it's a like a landscape, and let's say that you have a green tree, right? You know, or a tree, and so you draw in like the trunks and some of the branches and things, and then you can just hit it with a, a swipe of, you know, whatever color the leaves are, and if it's like wet in that area, and you let it kind of fuzz and bleed out. That's fine, you know. You don't have any lines in there that you have to stay within. You can just let it mm -hmm. be this nice organic shape, right? So, and again, you know, there's there's different there's there's different approaches to doing things like this, but it's a useful kind of tool to have in your bag of tricks. Um, and particularly, you know, for sketching, which is really what it's designed for, when you're out and about and you want to draw something, 
Um, a lot of times I will, you know, I like to use either Prismacolor pencil and or I'll use these like Sakura uh, little fine line pins or brush pins that have permanent ink in them. And that way, you know, I can sit and sketch, get a line down, maybe put in some tone roughly, you know, with that same medium. And then I can always come back in with watercolor and add little spots of color to it. And I don't have to worry about it bleeding or, you know, blurring the lines or anything. Um, and personally, I mean, I used to use like a steel tip pen, you know, with different points to do India ink drawings and things like that. But honestly, these days, I mean, you know, just getting a little set of those little permanent uh, pens that you have five or six uh, different widths, you know. What are they called? Well, I, I, I use the ones uh, by Sakura, which is Sakura? a Japanese. Yeah. S E C. Yeah. It's, uh, but you know, you can also, I mean, there's a lot of different pin sets out there. The you can use like a scripto marker, could you not? Uh, I know. Yeah, maybe. I mean, the main thing is just make sure that it is permanent, okay? And usually what I'll do is if I go to the art store and they've got uh, like these fine line pins, you know, I will, they usually have like little uh, scratch pieces of paper there, right? You know, I'll take one of the pens and I'll scribble on it and I'll give it a few minutes and then I'll come back and I'll just wet my finger and I'll see if it will smudge. If it smudges, you don't want it, okay? If you can go over it and it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't blur or anything, buy it, <laughs> okay? Um, because some of them say that they're permanent, but that doesn't mean that you can go back over it with water without it bleeding, you know? So I always check it before I, I go to the cash register to make sure that that's actually true. Uh, but I know that Sakura's are, um, and there's other, other pin sets and stuff that you can get uh, that are, just as good, you know. But, you know, basically I look for a pin set that's got at least five or six pins, and one of those pins, okay, and this is the important part, one of those pins is a brush pin, okay? And, and what that means is that instead of this fine little nib, it's got this kind of elongated nib to it that's almost like a paintbrush. Bob's holding, Bob, talk to us. Oh, oh, oh. Um, yeah, this, this is another variety that I, that I bought that, that works oh, good. Right. It's, uh, it does what you say. You can't, it's right. permanent, it really is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And any, you know, I mean, you can get them on Amazon. You can get them in the art store. And uh -huh. Bob, don't move. You just hold, hold the pin set up. No, at, no, where you can see the top of it. Oh, okay. Where you, where you can see the top of the uh, talk. Bob. Well, yes, I'm here. Okay. okay. Hold it in front of the camera. There you go. Okay. Now, you see how there's different sizes? Okay. And at the very, well, he's got a wedge. The only thing I see is you. I see you. <laughs> I'm talking. Bob. I'm talking. Talkie, 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 talkie. One, two, three, four, five, so seven, eight, yeah. seven, four, three, yeah. four, two. So over on the far right, it's hard to see that one because of the light, but I think either that's a brush pen or, you know, it's a different type yep. of shape. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. yep. Here we are. Yep. Do 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 do. There we go. All right. I'd sing, I'd sing, but you'd all leave. <laughs> no. Did you get it? Oh, uh, I got this one online. Black liner permanent. Yeah. It's German, yeah. But if, if you go on, uh, if you go on Amazon and stuff like that, the only advantage or disadvantage to buying stuff online is that you don't have a chance to test it. And but if someone has already bought it before you, then 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 you know. 
Me, yeah. I, I testify to this guy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, they, so, so he's our, it's, it's pre tested. Right. Yeah. Yes. But that's that's if you trust Bob. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Well, and you got me uh, pretty shaky there. <laughs> Just so, on this. Just on this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I would consider Bob a reliable. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, anyway, let's uh, let's see. Where do we want to go from here? All right. Let's see if we can squeeze one more video in. Okay. But this time, we'll change okay. it up and we'll look at somebody's artwork. Okay. So. <clears throat> <clears throat> and, okay. Uh, let's look at this guy right here. Okay, Gustav. Well, wait a minute. No, he's got fifty some odd minutes. Let's do. Let's look at Sicily's work instead. Oh wait a minute. Okay. Yes, I better. Hi, I'm Abel Keith, better known as House Sketchy, and I love creating energetic architectural drawing. Good for you. Okay. 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 That's um, um, <laughs> stop this right here just for a second okay and all of you since we've had this conversation many many times before really take a look at this painting and notice how he's pushed the background back in the distance and how he's brought the foreground forward okay? really on both sides of the canvas right over on the left you can see these houses are sharper and clearer in, uh, California. Charles, can you, excuse me, can you please mute all of us? Yeah, I know, we're, we're getting a little, here. I'm going to have to get out of this to do that, though. All right. So, stop share and mute, or let's unmute. Mute all. There we go. Yes. Continue. All right, so as I was saying, I want you to notice how he basically got the background and mid-ground to recede here. Um, you know, there's, there's more contrast in the areas in the foreground. And as he goes back, there's less and less contrast. And then in the background, all those values and things, the colors seem to kind of fall together. And it gives you this illusion of space. Um, that's something that each and every one of you need to think about, you know, as you're trying to paint a landscape or even a still life for that matter of fact.
Okay, that's not the end of that, but I think you got the idea. Um, okay, let's stop that. Okay, all right. Let me see if I can unmute everybody. All right, yay, okay. Well, most, most of you are unmuted. Okay, so what did you guys think of uh, Cicely's work? I, I loved it, uh, but he, uh, <laughs> he worked fairly small, really. I mean, yes, yeah. I mean, yeah. the biggest biggest one I saw was ninety two centimeters, which is what forty two inches, something like that. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but if you look at a forty two inch painting up on the wall, mm -hmm. that isn't really a large painting, but it's not it's, small either. It's well, small. no, but I mean, the large majority of them were like. 33 by 18 centimeters or, you know, they he, very little of his work was big. Right, yeah. Well, again, though, you know, think about who he was and what he was doing. Um, a lot of those were not painted in the studio. They were painted out in the field, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he was pretty much a plein air painter. Um, and the thing I like about Sicily is, this painting move, you know, they're not static. Um, yes. Everything seems to be moving. It's, it's like you can kind of feel 
the fields rustling, you know, in the wind and stuff. Um, the other I, thing, I think his use of, of color, it was sort of muted, but not blaring, but mm -hmm. uh, it was just, I really like it. Would he be considered impressionist? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he would be uh, an impressionist painter. Um, you know, yeah. one, one thing about, you know, his work, I think was, as John mentioned, was the color of it, but also it was the brushwork, you know? I mean, he didn't spend a lot of time, you know, blending edges and things together. He was a very kind of direct painter. And I think that's the thing that gives his paintings this feeling of life. Um, you know, I mean, when you look at those, I mean, they're, they're just, it's like he just painted it, you know, they're really mm -hmm. fresh and he didn't overwork anything. Um, you know, and so, I mean, I, I would spend a lot of time looking at his work, you know, particularly look at his trees, you know, um, it's like every tree had a personality. They were all different, right? And, uh, and so, you know, he wasn't painting, you know, like a formula or anything like that. He was actually observing, you know, and seeing things and painting them, um, you know, from his own experience. You know, one of the other amazing things is, if you really think about it, most of those paintings were done right around Paris. In fact, some of them were done in areas of Paris now that don't look anything like that. I mean, it looked like Montmartre was, you know, you think, you know, in his painting looked like it was in the countryside. If you go there today, it's right smack dab in the middle of Paris. There's nothing but neighborhoods and everything. You're not gonna see a field and any trees there, you know? There's no room for them. It's nothing but, you know, houses all over the place. Um, so it, it was it was definitely a good documentation of what Paris was like, you know, at that point in time. And yes, by standards of that day, it was still a big city, but it is nothing like that now. <laughs> it's just gone. So, you know what's still what's still there though is the Saint Martin Canal. Uh huh. A lot of people don't know about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were there long enough that, uh, you know, we could find out about it and, and go to it. It was, you know, uh, quite a ways away from the main part, but, but it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the canal, lovely. Yeah. yeah. Paris and that whole area is, is really, I mean, as a city, is beautiful. Um, and it's, it's kind of one of those cities that's got so many different things to offer you know it's it's not a flat city you know there's vistas and you can get up you know on certain hills and areas like that and really really get a good view of of the city um it's a lot more difficult in atlanta to find that <laughs> you mm -hmm. know you, yeah you don't have that many places that you can really get up above and really see it uh without going out to like kennesaw mountain or Stone Mountain, you know, those are the closest places really to get up above the city. And the thing is, you can see the city, but you're so far outside of it, where in Paris, it's like really kind of part of the city. Uh, and so there's a, a, a lot of uneven terrain there, um, you know, to paint. So anyhow, that's about it for today. Anybody else got anything? Uh, we need to cover. <laughs> Come on, don't be shy. We'll see you tomorrow too. Okay, sounds good. You know, Char Charles, I sent you. I, I emailed you two portraits that I did. I hope they came through. Okay, so, I'll check, and if they did, that. I'll send you back an email to let you know that I got them. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. So other than that, 
you know, it's it looks like it's going to rain today. Today would be a good day to get out some paint. You know, do a little do a little artwork. Okay. Mm -hmm. So anyway, thank you all for coming. And okay, thank you. We'll <laughs> thank see you. We'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.